you so much. So excited to be presenting today. Um, so, so just from an agenda perspective, we're going to start with the state of application security today. We'll go through some of the challenges that we see in GitHub to improving the state of application security today. And then we'll start to talk about what, what it actually means to be a developer first, first or to take a developer first approach. Um, I look forward to all of your questions at the end. So feel free to definitely submit them now. So the state of application security today, well, we all want to shift security left, right? Like we've been talking about shifting security left for a while. It actually, it, it makes a lot of sense, right? Um, nobody wants to find vulnerabilities late in the cycle. It costs a lot. It's a very painful for developers. You then have to context switch back to this problem that you may have looked at, this code that you may have looked at six months ago. Of course, we never want to get into a breach. We know how expensive that is, the average one being $3.9 million. So it makes sense, right? Like we want to move things earlier. We want to catch vulnerabilities earlier in the life cycle, um, ideally in development, right? Like that's the cheapest, that's the least painful. But the reality is we've actually been trying to shift left for at least a decade. We look at this picture. This is a picture from the IBM Security Systems Report. This is back in 2012. And what you notice is that the numbers, the, 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 the visualization, it's really the same thing that we're talking about in, in that updated um, visualization that I just showed you. So we've been talking about shifting left for at least the last decade, at least the last decade. We're also introducing vulnerabilities at the same rate. So this was, this was super enlightening for me. Uh, so the GitHub data science team analyzed 70 million lines of open source code. You can think about this like the Linux kernel or Kubernetes or Ruby on Rails. And what we noticed was that as the lines of code increases, the amount of security threats also increase, but at a linear rate. What's interesting about this is that that rate has not changed over the past six years. But we've been talking about DevSecOps I actually looked it up. The, last, the first time we used that word with Google News was 2015, right? So we've been talking about DevSecOps. We've been talking about shift left, but we're still in this same problem. Now, you may say, hey, like, th this is only for open source. But actually, Microsoft is the top open source corporate contributor out there. So the same developers who are contributing to open source are also working within our companies, right? So we are still introducing vulnerabilities at the same rate both in open source as well as within enterprise, I would argue. So what's the actual challenge, right? Like what are the challenges to improving application security today? Well, we know that security teams are, are vastly outnumbered, um, right? There's about 40 million professional developers out there. There's only about 70,000 security researchers, right? That's 570 to one. If we look in an enterprise, usually the number comes out to about 100 developers to every one security researcher. Security teams are vastly outnumbered. 82% um, of security IT professionals say teams are understaffed. 70% um, like they, they, there's a cybersecurity skills shortage. What we see in security today is it's a zero sum game, right? There's just not enough security researchers. So we need to figure out a way to scale this. Right, that, that's, that's obvious, right? We need, to, we need to figure out some automation over here because if we don't, like they are just vastly outnumbered for the amount of developers that there are out there. The other big problem that we have, the other big challenge that we have is that securing first, part, first party software is really just the beginning, right? Like this, this, uh, to me, this is actually even conservative, right? 30% of your first party, of your application is first party code about 70% is open source code, right? So, so essentially what you're doing is you're giving production access to anybody, to any of the open source developers that may not even know what your application is. But right? this traditionally has not been covered by any dedicated security team. The, the, the last big challenge that I wanted to hit on is that security for, for the most part just isn't part of the developer workflow. You can see this study over here of SAS scans per year. Um, we actually see how the vast majority of companies are still only running SAS between one and six times per year. It's, it's actually under 10% of companies 
are, are actually running this more than once a week or, or running SAS static analysis more than once a week. Right? So security just isn't part of the developer workflow. We know this already. Um, it's just not part of the developer workflow. So we need to start to think about how, how we change that even with this shift left that we've been talking about for so long. You know, it's interesting. I, I ran a poll about six months ago. This was with, it was, it was an informal poll. It was with 100 enterprise customers. And I asked them, how integrated are your SaaS practices? And so there was a couple of different levels. Level one, no SaaS. By the way, shocking how many people were not running SaaS, uh, period. And level two was running SaaS periodically. Level three, integrated SaaS as part of your CI. Now, you would think that integrated SaaS as part of CI, great, right? Like we've shifted left. But I had a fourth choice over here. And that was developers actually trust the automated SaaS results. And a mere 5% said that their developers actually trust the automated SaaS results. What that means it, to me is that we can't just take the same traditional tools that we've been using that have not been designed for developers, that have been desi designed for security professionals. We can't take those same tools and just expect that to plug them in in the developer life cycle earlier on in the life cycle and just expect them to work, right? We need to start designing for developers. This is why we have such a low um, percentage where developers actually trust these results. Before I go on, I would like to talk about this painting for a second um, and, and I'll make a comparison from it. So in the middle, uh, this is actually a painting of, of surgery happening in the late 1800s. In the middle is Joseph Lister. Joseph Lister is considered uh, by many the, the father of modern day surgery. And there are two technological innovations in the 1800s that occur. On the left-hand side is an anesthesiologist. That anesthesiologist is putting the patient uh, under, is making that patient um, unconscious. You have to remember back in those days, surgery was an agonizing experience. The surgeon had to make cuts and tears while the patient was normally up and awake. And, and this made the, the entire surgery very, very complicated. So that's an innovation, the anesthesia. And on the right-hand side is a gentleman spraying an antiseptic spray, actually known as carbolic acid. And what that does is that prevents germs from entering into the body. Um, pre, the, pre this carbolic acid, actually 50% uh, of people going to surgery died from sepsis. So these are two major innovations in surgery, but they took actually very different divergent paths towards adoption. Let's actually explore that. So anesthetics. Anesthetics was first discovered in, in 1846. Um, this gentleman named William Morton brought it to Henry J. Bigelow. So I can change surgery. I can operate on people that are unconscious. So they took this to, they, they tried it out at work. They took this to a couple of other folks. Within one year, this is, this is used, right? This is used worldwide within a year. It's absolutely ubiquitous within seven years, right? Anesthesia just takes off like that. And you think about it from a surgeon's perspective, why wouldn't it, right? Like, this is amazing. We can actually make tears and cuts without the person in writhing agony. Um, and, and, and we can get better results as well. Well, antiseptics took, took, takes a completely different adoption path. So this is first discovered in 1865 by Joseph Lister. Um, he's operating on a seven-year-old child with a fractured leg, um, realizes that there's this thing called carbolic acid that reduces the smell of sewage. So what did they try this out? Like, what if we try carbolic acid to prevent the sewage from entering my body? from entering that patient's body. Um, so tries it out, it works, and then starts to do studies. Study after study confirms that the rate of surgery is highly much more successful when using carbolic acid. This even gets published into The Lancet. The Lancet is one of the most premier uh, medical journals even to this day. But what's interesting is that it ends up being highly divisive. People do not want to use antiseptics. They don't want to use carbolic acid. And the main reason why is it actually hurts the surgeon's eyes. It burns their fingers. It's painful for the surgeon, even though it comes out with, even though there are better rates of success, it's very painful for the surgeon. 
the surgeon doesn't want to deal with it. So of course, half-heartedly, this gets adopted by the mid 1880s. Right, this ends up becoming ubiquitous in the 1900s, but it takes a good 40, 50 years in order for that to go through. Why did these two technologies take such different paths? This is, of course, considered the foundation of modern surgery. I want to make a comparison over here. Anesthetics is like DevOps. It just made sense. right? It made the lives of dev developers easier. Who doesn't want to ship security fast? Who doesn't want to ship software faster with less bugs? So DevOps was actually adopted by choice. But security, on the other hand, it still feels like we are like we are spraying carbolic acid on our developers. It hurts, it's painful, it works, but it's still painful. So what if we shifted the mindset? Like what if we started to do things in a developer first manner? So we at GitHub started to do this. Um, we actually, our, our investment into security dates back probably four years ago at this point, where we started to, um, we started to send out vulnerability alerts for any open source dependencies that you may have that you may be using that have a vulnerability associated with them. I mean, we thought this was amazing. This was we thought this was a game changer, right? You don't have to run any additional tools. You just check into your GitHub repo and we will automatically alert you. What we found though was that developers did not like this solution. They got too many notifications. They were bombarded by information. We were focusing on problems, not solutions. And so we we changed a little bit. We started to get a little bit more developer focused over here and we shipped what's known as the Pandabot, which opens up a pull request for the developer, right? This actually changes, actually bumps up a dependency version to a non-vulnerable version. It automatically, it, all, it already solves the issue. All the developer now has to do is click the merge button. And what we saw was truly amazing. Developers were fixing uh, open source dependency issues twice as fast when using Dependabot as opposed to not using Dependabot. And so this is what we start to say, we're shifting the way we, we are, we're, being a developer requires that mindset shift, right? Beforehand, we were outside of the developer workflow. We're now at the heart of the developer workflow. We're focusing on a solution. We're actually automating the entire journey in order to um, fix that result, in order to fix that vulnerability. That's what developer first means. So let's think about this. Like, what does this mean actually in, in other domains as well? Like credential scanning. So the interesting thing at, at, at GitHub, like we've actually been doing secret scanning for a good amount of time. Um, if you submit a, uh, if you put a GitHub personal access token into a GitHub public repository, we'll actually invalidate that immediately. There's really not much risk in doing so. Um, the thing with credentials is it's extremely common to, to, to put a, a secret or a token into a repo. I've done it personally myself as a developer. Um, it just happens, right? So this is extremely common. It's extremely damaging because once that is out there, everybody who views that repository now has elevated permissions to whatever that token is associated with. Um, and it's actually really easy to detect, right? Like, it, like it's just a couple of regexes with a little post-processing. So the big question is, right, like the, we, we sort of go through these remediation workflows. What if we start to prevent secrets from ever making it into your repository, from ever making it into GitHub? This is actually the perfect candidate to ship left, to put it into a pre-received hook. Well, what's the problem with that? The problem is false positives. Developers are now responsible for triaging those findings. This is why developers hate it. Um, there tends to be a, a lot of noisy patterns. Um, actually, Microsoft rolled their own secret scanning. And what they found was there was a 50% false positive rate. That's a huge false positive rate. Imagine as a developer, you just want to check in your code at 5 p.m. and go you know, and get out of the office, but, but you're now being blocked by a false positive. And now you have to figure out how to, how to navigate around this. So false positive is, 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 is really tough to deal with. And so what we found was that solu this, these solutions end up being rejected by developers. Well, what if we start to design for developers, right? Like what if we start to design around the developer experience? Well, firstly, we're going to need a better triage experience. We, we need to make it as easy as possible for, for a developer to override when the, there is a false positive. 
Um, maybe we don't prevent all of those secrets from entering. For, um, maybe we don't prevent all of the secrets in a pre-received book. Maybe the ones with a false positive, right? We actually just go through the remediation workflow and allow that to pass. That way developers don't get frustrated. Um, it, you know, the other thing that we're thinking about is why not just, just scan at while you're coding as well. The thing that GitHub right now is doing also is we're looking at the industry to push our partners to, to actually reduce the amount of false positives that, that are out there. If the tokens are, are more visible to us, right? Like they have a check digit so we can mathematically figure out if this is a valid token, that will then reduce the false positive rate as well. And so this is what, what I'm talking about, like designing around the developer experience. I'm gonna go through one more worked example, which is developer first static analysis, right? We saw, what, we saw that static analysis is not integrated as part of the developer ecosystem. Well, the state of static analysis, firstly, there's thousands of results. This is great for a security engineer, this is terrible for a developer. For a security engineer, you, you just triage everything and you figure what, what, what's valid, what's not. For a developer, there's too much noise. They end up rejecting the entire solution. Um, we, we, this is actually why also, right? Like static analysis in general is part of a separate portal, not part of the developer workflow. This is why so few teams actually are adopting static analysis within the developer workflow. So what if we started to, to design for the developer? Well, firstly, we believe that it should happen at code review time. We believe that it should feel like a security expert is reviewing your code and giving you meaningful and real results. We also believe that it should produce accurate and relevant results. Our goal, we're not there yet, but our goal is to get a 90% fix rate. That's what, that's what we believe is, is the bar. That's what makes sense to us, 90% fix rate. Also a great experience, should, it should include suggestions. Hey, maybe do this and that, and, and that will actually fix your issue. But again, like part and parcel integrated in as part of, of, of GitHub, as, as part of the developer tools. And also this one's a, a, a little bit subtle. It should aggregate the world's security efforts, right? There shouldn't just be one, one, one team or, or one company doing security, we should start to get the, the expertise of those 70,000 security researchers all around the world. Well, this is what we're building, right? Like we are building this. Um, we started off with, with code scanning, where we're taking a technology, a SaaS technology known as CodeQL, we're integrating it deep into the developer workflow. On the right-hand side, you can see a picture of GitHub. Now there's just another security tab. This is part and parcel as part of the developer workflow. We're not giving you thousands of results, but we're going to give you real results um, that you can actually fix. There's secret scanning as well, which looks for private, you know, which looks for any secrets within those private repositories. Um, again, like. We're getting, we're marching our way up to preventative workflows, but this is where we started with it. It's truly amazing. You just click a button and you're done. And then finally, that those depend about security updates where we're actually updating the repo. We're actually opening up um, pull requests for you whenever an open source dependency is found. Um, you can check this out, right? GitHub.com slash features slash security. That will give you full details of what we've been working on and where we're going. We're very excited about it. One closing thought before we open it up to questions. If we build for developers, we can shift left, right? Like this has been the issue in the industry is that we haven't designed for developers. And so I truly believe if, if we start to actually build for the developers, if we get into the mindset of developers, we will actually increase that fix rate. We've been obsessed a lot about finding vulnerabilities, but not about actually fixing vulnerabilities. And that's something that we've been focusing on is is, try, is really focusing on how we can actually start to fix vulnerabilities, not just find them. So if we build for developers, we can shift that. Thank you.